Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft, and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous video in this series, we introduced several one-step methods for numerically integrating ODE initial value problems. Here we're going to analyze the convergence properties of these methods. We're first going to look at how we can prove convergence, and we're also going to introduce the concept of the order of accuracy of a numerical method. We'll now consider whether one-step methods converge to the exact solution as our numerical step size h tends to zero. And convergence is a crucial property since we want to be able to satisfy an accuracy tolerance by taking h sufficiently small. And in general, if we have a method that isn't convergent, then it can give misleading results and can be really useless in practice. And in the field of scientific computing, it's therefore very important to be able to demonstrate the convergence of different numerical methods. For ODEs, looking at convergence is rather subtle, and this is because errors can build up over time. Suppose that we take one step of our integration scheme, then we'll incur some numerical error. Now let's suppose that we take a second step in our scheme will incur some new numerical error. However, in addition, because of that error on the first step, we will be slightly off from the true mathematical solution. And therefore, we'll also get some effect of compounding error from that previous deviation in our numerical solution. And we'll now introduce several definitions that can help us unravel these effects. So, Let's define now the global error, ek, to be the total accumulated error at t equal tk. So we'll have that ek is equal to y evaluated at tk minus yk. And we'll also define the truncation error, capital T subscript k, that's the amount that's left over at step k when we apply our numerical method to the exact solution and divide by h. So for an explicit one-step ODE approximation, we have that the truncation error, tk, is equal to y of tk plus 1 minus y of tk divided by h minus our operator phi evaluated at tk and y of tk. So the truncation error defined above determines the local error that's introduced by the ODE approximation. And for example, let's suppose that yk is equal to the true solution y of tk. Then for the case above, we have that h times the truncation error tk is equal to y of tk plus 1 minus yk minus h of phi evaluated at tk and yk. And that will just be equal to y at tk plus 1 minus yk plus 1. So therefore, htk is the error that's introduced in one step of our ODE approximation. And the global error, ek, will be determined by the accumulation of the tj for j equal 1 up to k minus 1. So now let's consider the global error of the Euler method in more detail. And we have the following theorem. Suppose that we apply Euler's method for steps 1, 2 up to capital M to the equation y prime is equal to f of t and y. And we'll also demand that f satisfies a Lipschitz condition. So specifically, we'll have that f of t and u minus f of t and v, the magnitude of this has to be less than or equal to a constant L subscript f times the magnitude of u minus v. And here, Lf is a real number that's greater than zero and it's referred to as the Lipschitz constant, and this has to be true for all u and v. And essentially, this tells us that our function, if it's evaluated for two 
values, u and v that are close together, then the function itself has to evaluate to a similar result. If we have this condition, then we can say that the magnitude of global error at step k, ek, has to be less than or equal to e to the lf times tk minus 1 divided by lf times the maximum over all of the truncation errors in magnitude tj. And this will be true for k equals 0 up to m. And here then, the tj is the Euler method truncation error. So let's now look at proving this result. Let's now look at proving the convergence properties of the forward Euler method. And we'll look at taking steps 1 to m of the Euler method applied to the scalar ODE, y prime is equal to f of t and y. And here, f satisfies a Lipschitz condition where the magnitude of f of t and u minus f of t and v is less than or equal to lf times the magnitude of u minus v for all valid t, u, and v. And here, lf is a real positive constant that we refer to as the Lipschitz constant. Then we can say that the magnitude of global error at step k, ek, is less than or equal to e to the lf tk minus 1 divided by lf times the maximum from 0 to k minus 1 of the magnitude of tj, where tj is the Euler method truncation error at step j. And we're going to look at proving this result, but first let's look in more detail at the Lipschitz condition. And the reason that this is important is that it tells us that if we sample our function at two nearby values, u and v, then it allows us to bound the difference in the function evaluation in terms of that distance between u and v. And this will be very important in the subsequent proof. So let's look at a few examples of Lipschitz conditions to begin with. And we're going to look at a simpler case here where we just have a scalar function, g of x, that satisfies a Lipschitz condition over the interval from a to b. And this will be true if the magnitude of g of x minus g of y is less than or equal to lf times the magnitude of x minus y. And this has to be true for all x minus y in this interval from a to b and for some positive lf greater than zero. And we can think about this Lipschitz condition geometrically, and if we draw a particular point on our function, and we draw two pairs of lines that have slope lf, then our function g has to be contained within the two triangular wedges that are formed by these lines. And since this has to be true for all x and y over the interval, then it has to be true if we think about sliding this pair of lines down our function, and if we were to look at the same lines at a different position, then our function would still have to be contained within those triangular wedges. So let's now take a look at a few specific examples. So our first example will be if g is continuously differentiable. And in this case, we can use the mean value theorem from analysis. And this will tell us that the magnitude of g of x minus g of y is equal to the magnitude of g prime of theta times the magnitude of x minus y for some theta in the range from a to b. And therefore, we can set that 
LF is equal to the maximum for theta in the interval from A to B of G prime of theta in magnitude. And if we have this LF, then that will guarantee that this bound is satisfied for all X and Y. And since G is continuously differentiable, we know that this maximum will be a finite value. As a second example, let's look at the function g of x is equal to the absolute value of x. And this is a good example because this is not differentiable, but we can still establish a Lipschitz condition in this case. And if we look now at the magnitude of g of x minus g of y, then that is equal to the magnitude of the magnitude of x minus the magnitude of y. And that is less than or equal to the magnitude of x minus y. And we can use the reverse triangle inequality to establish this. And that then implies that LF is equal to 1. As a third example, let's look at the function g of x is equal to the square root of x on the interval from 0 to 1. And while this is a continuous function, we can actually find that it does not satisfy a Lipschitz condition. And suppose that we look at putting y equals 0 into our definition, then we'll have that the magnitude of g of x minus g of 0 over x minus 0 is equal to the square root of x over x. And we can drop the magnitude signs because we're only dealing in a, with positive numbers. And that will be equal to the 1 over the square root of x. And that will tend to infinity as x tends to 0. And that therefore tells us that there'll be no particular LF here that will bound our Lipschitz constant. Now, we can also visualize this graphically. And suppose that we drew the function square root of x. Then if we were to try and draw this pair of lines with any slope LF, then the problem that we have is that G has infinite slope as we approach zero. And therefore, there'll be some point here where whatever value of LF we choose, our function G will no longer remain within these triangular wedges. So this is one example, therefore, of a continuous function where we do not have the Lipschitz property. Let's now look at proving this result, and we'll begin with the definitions. We'll define the global error at step k, ek, to be equal to the mathematical solution, y evaluated at time point tk, minus our numerical solution, yk. And we'll define the truncation error by substituting our mathematical solution into our numerical scheme and looking at the amount that's left over. And we'll therefore have that tk is equal to y of tk plus 1 minus y of tk divided by h plus f of tk and y of tk. Now, if we look at our numerical scheme, then we have that yk plus 1 is equal to yk plus h of f and tk yk. And if we rearrange our truncation error, then we find that y of tk plus 1 is equal to y of tk plus
plus h times f of tk y of tk plus h tk. And if we now subtract off our numerical scheme from this tk expression, then we'll see that we get two terms that convert into global errors. So we'll have that this is equal to ek plus 1, and we'll have ek and then h of f of tk y of tk minus f of tk yk plus h of tk. And this expression shows us how this compounding error effect comes in. The global error at step k plus 1 is given in terms of the global error at step k plus the truncation error at step k. And then we also have this term. And here we're looking at our function evaluated at our mathematical solution and also our numerical solution. And this therefore captures how the discrepancy between our mathematical solution and our numerical solution can create additional error. So now we're going to look at bounding this term. And one thing we can note here is that the difference between these two evaluations is y of tk and yk, and that is precisely equal to ek. So we can actually bound this term using our Lipschitz condition. And that gives us that the magnitude of ek plus 1 is less than or equal to the magnitude of ek plus h times lf of the magnitude of ek plus h times the magnitude of tk using the triangle inequality. And we can write that therefore as 1 plus h lf times the magnitude of ek plus the h times the magnitude of tk. And now let's look at a particular case that will allow us to generalize afterward. So suppose that we look at the magnitude of e3. So that will be less than or equal to 1 plus h lf times the magnitude of e2 plus h times the magnitude of t2. And if we now apply our bound again to e2, then we know that this is less than or equal to 1 plus h lf times 1 plus h lf times the magnitude of e1 plus h times the magnitude of t1. And then we've still got this term h times the magnitude of t2. And we can now apply the bound once more to this e1. And we know that e0 is equal to 0 because our numerical solution and mathematical solution agree at the very beginning. And we're therefore left with that this is less than or equal to 1 plus h lf squared times h times the magnitude of t0 plus 1 plus h lf times h times the magnitude of t1 plus h times the magnitude of t2. And we can now replace these t's with the maximum term, and that will allow us to write that this is less than or equal to h times the maximum from j equal 0 to 2 of the magnitude of tj times the sum from j equals 0 to 2 of 1 plus h lf to the j. And we can now generalize this idea to an arbitrary ek. And we see here that if we generalize, we'll have that the magnitude of ek is less than or equal to h times the maximum from j equal 0 to k minus 1 
of the magnitude of tj times the sum from j equals 0 to k minus 1 of 1 plus h lf to the j. And we'll note here that this is a geometric series. And we can use the geometric series formula that tells us that the sum from j equals 0 to k minus 1 of r to the j can be written as 1 minus r to the k over 1 minus r. And in this case, r will be equal to 1 plus h lf. So using this formula, we know that the magnitude of ek is less than or equal to 1 over lf times the maximum from j equals 0 to k minus 1 of the magnitude of tj times 1 plus h lf to the k minus 1. And if we now look at e to the h lf, then we know that this is equal to 1 plus h lf plus h lf squared over 2 factorial and other terms. And since all of these terms are positive, we know that this is greater than or equal to 1 plus h lf. And therefore, we can replace this term with e to the h lf to get another bound. So we'll find then that the magnitude of ek is less than or equal to 1 over lf times the maximum from j equals 0 to k minus 1 of the magnitude of tj times e to the lf tk minus 1. And that establishes our convergence theorem. Now that we've derived our error bound on ODE integration, let's look at what it can tell us about convergence. And if we look at the factor of e to the lft minus 1 divided by lf, then this will be a constant that is independent of our integration step size h. And that therefore tells us that the global convergence of the method for a fixed t will be governed by the dependence of our truncation errors on h. And while our proof was for Euler's method, the same dependence of global error on local error holds in general. And we'll say that a method has order of accuracy p if our truncation errors scale like order h to the p, where p is an integer. And therefore, ODE methods with order greater than or equal to 1 are convergent. Now let's look at some of the methods that we introduced and evaluate the order of accuracy. So if we look at forward Euler, then this is first order accurate. And the truncation error, tk, will be equal to y of tk plus 1 minus y of tk divided by h minus f of tk and y of tk. And we can use our ODE to write this as y of tk plus 1 minus y of tk divided by h minus y prime of tk. And we can now expand the y of tk plus 1 using Taylor's theorem. And that will give us h divided by 2 times y double prime of theta, where theta is some value between tk and tk plus 1. And therefore, this is order h, and we have a first order method. If we look at backward Euler, then this is also first order accurate. And we can follow through similar steps here, but now we will Taylor expand at y of tk plus 1, and we'll end up showing that the truncation error is equal to minus h divided by 2 times y double prime of theta, where again theta is some value between tk and tk plus 1. The trapezoid method is second order accurate, 
and we can prove this using the quadrature error bound. And recall that y of tk plus 1 is equal to y of tk plus this integral from tk to tk plus 1 of f of s and y of s ds. And therefore, we have that y of tk plus 1 minus y of tk divided by h is equal to 1 over h times this integral from tk to tk plus 1. And therefore, we can write our truncation error tk is equal to 1 divided by h times the integral from tk to tk plus 1 of f at s and y of s ds minus a half times f of tk and y of tk plus f of tk plus 1 and y of tk plus 1. We now have an expression for our truncation error in terms of several evaluations of f and using our ODE we can replace those by y primes and therefore tk can be determined in terms of the trapezoid rule error for the integrand y prime over the interval from tk to tk plus 1. And we've already looked at how the trapezoid error will behave. And we know that the trapezoid error bound depends on b minus a cubed, which in this case is equal to tk minus 1 minus tk cubed. And that's just equal to h cubed. And since we have a factor of 1 over h in front, then we can deduce that our truncation error is order h squared. We can verify these convergence properties by looking at a simple example of y prime is equal to y using the initial condition of y of 0 is equal to 1. And in the table here, I'm showing the global error of our solutions at t equal 1 using both the forward Euler method and the trapezoid method for a variety of step sizes h. And if we divide the step size by 2, then we can see that the global error for the Euler method is roughly divided in 2. However, for the trapezoid method, the global error is roughly divided by a factor of 4. And this is consistent with the forward Euler method being an order 1 method, whereas the trapezoid method is an order 2 method.